know where your office was. So I asked the newsboy. He didn't know. So I asked the fireman, the green grocer, the butcher, the baker. They didn't know. But the liquor store guy, he knew. Let's talk about character exposition. Character exposition is a vital part of character development. You can have a developed character in your head, complete with backstories, personality, and quirks. But how do you reveal all those important character details to the audience? That's exposition. Now, I'm sure some of you have seen some bad character exposition. You may not be able to define it, but you can feel it. Sometimes it's a ridiculously obtuse plot dump. Your life is the sum of a remainder of You are the eventuality of an anomaly which, despite my sincere while it remains a burden to make it what is otherwise a harmony of mathematical precision. Jesus, I didn't realize I was going to have to solve for X. Anyway, sometimes it's just childishly obvious. You're so beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. No, it's because I'm so in love with you. So love has blinded you? You don't say! And sometimes, well, there's whatever the hell this is. This is Katana! She's got my back! I would advise not getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. Be still my heart. Such poetry. So, yeah, it can be a tricky business. But is there an example of a film that gets character exposition right? Well, it's Easter time, and that's got me thinking about rabbits. This is Fanscription. Who Framed Roger Rabbit has some of the best character exposition you'll ever see in a modern blockbuster. Hell, it's some of the best character exposition you'll see in a movie, period. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. How dare you, sir? There are masters of the art out there who have poured their heart and soul into their expository craft. I mean, Hitchcock's Rear Window, Ford Coppola's Godfather, Roman Polanski's Chinatown. That was pre ooey stuff with him. I can talk about it and praise it. And here you are, using the cartoon rabbit lark as your shining example. Hell, it's just Chinatown for children. Jessica Rabbit rabbit is just Faye Dunaway with an even more impressive rack. Wow. Okay, you uh, really took that seriously. And have a thing for Jessica Rabbit. I mean, fair enough. Who doesn't? But if you give me a second, I'll explain why this film deserves a little more love. For one thing, all these movies could afford to be highbrow masterpieces because they operated in a different environment. Roger Rabbit was a modern blockbuster. It had to appease just about everybody and nail a dozen different tones and genres while featuring state-of-the-art effects. That this movie worked at all is a miracle, and it's proof that lightning can strike twice. Cause if pop culture is right, and Back to the Future is a perfectly directed movie, then this film is its successor. That's right, you heard me. Robert Zemeckis made two perfect films back to back. What's the secret? One word, character. We are invested, and for good reason, because the filmmakers put all of their care into crafting a believable world populated with a cast of interesting characters. But they disseminated that world and its characters to us in a series of perfectly paced small plates. So instead of being force-fed gallons of character exposition through a fire hose, we're instead spoon-fed a little bit at a time, just right. It's economical storytelling, and Roger Rabbit is a master class in how to do it. So let's look at how this film tackles one of its big problems. How do you introduce your main protagonist, Eddie Valiant? The answer? Three major techniques. Dialogue, action, and maison-scene. Now, dialogue is obvious. That can be a character talking about themselves, or maybe it's a supporting character getting in on the act. Eddie can say, I hate tunes, but Dolores can add, a tune killed his brother. Easy enough. Now, action can be anything they're doing. How do they carry themselves? What's their job? Do they drink, sleep all day, check out the ladies, threaten others, fire a gun, hitchhike? 
Eddie stowing away on the red line is an action, and it's also exposition. It shows he's broke and has no problem cheating the system. What about supporting characters? Notice how the other cops bully him with the Acme props. That one action tells us Eddie isn't respected. He's a joke. Instant exposition. Finally, there's mise-en-scene. Now, mise-en-scene is a fancy French word that refers to anything that appears in front of the camera and how it's arranged. Set design, lighting, composition, costuming, props, and even the actors themselves. Technically, this means that there's mise-en-scene everywhere. However, for our purposes, we're going to focus on one moment where the mise-en-scene takes center stage, even to the point where the scene drops the actor himself. And this is going to be the linchpin of Eddie's character exposition. So how do all of these elements coalesce in the first act of Roger Rabbit? How can a few lines of dialogue, a little action, and a maison-scene pan and scan tell us who Eddie Valiant really is? Well, let's start from the very beginning, because Roger Rabbit doesn't waste any time. From the first second where Eddie walks into frame, you learn three key points about this guy. Check it out. <sighs> Tunes. Did you see what happened there? We got the dialogue, tunes. We got the action, drinking. And even a second action, putting the booze in the gun holster. That was 15 seconds, and already we've learned, one, he doesn't respect tunes. Two, he probably has a drinking problem. And three, he used to work with a gun. But that's long since past, since now he's using his holster to store whiskey. This is organic storytelling. Nothing feels forced. It's simply the character doing what he does. Let's see what we can learn in Maroon's office. What's this got to do with me? You're the private detective. You figure it out. Okay, so now we know he's a private detective. This answers any questions about the gun holster. Forget it. I don't work in time. All right. He has a hang-up about working with tunes. You don't want to go to Toontown, you don't have to go to Toontown. The Rabbit's Wife sings at a joint called the Ingham Paint Club. Toon Review. Strictly humans only, okay? Now we know there's a Toontown, and we know that tunes are second-class citizens. That's because they're performing in segregated nightclubs. Humans only. Similar to New York's Cotton Club in the 1930s. The job's gonna cost you a hundred bucks. Plus expenses. A hundred bucks? That's ridiculous. So's the job. Well... Eddie needs the money, because he's taking this guy to the cleaners. And while all this dialogue is going on, look at Eddie's actions. Have a drink, Eddie. I don't mind if I do. Did you see the way he stared at that bottle? We've now confirmed that he'll just shamelessly drink in front of anybody. And did you catch the look on Maroon's face? Aw, does baby want his baba? You see how much we've learned from just one conversation? Let's keep going. What do I look like, a bank? So the dialogue and action here tell us that Eddie doesn't carry cash. We can assume he's hard on his luck. So what does he do? He sneaks on board, makes some new friends, and... Thanks for the cigarettes! <laughs> that's, that's amazing. So, how about a little more action? See the sign? It's hanging loose. Probably because the place is run down. And what does it say? Valiant and Valiant. So now we know there's another Valiant. Where is he? We'll have to find out. In the meantime... Okay, what you got for me? The usual bills. <laughs> that action tells us a lot right there. He owes money, but he doesn't care. Odds are this is a common ritual for him. And what's the first thing he does? Stares at the bar across the street. Inside the bar, it's clear Eddie knows the regulars and has sympathy for the working man. We then get another reveal from a supporting character. And if I don't have that money I gave you back in the till, I'm gonna lose my job. Don't bust a button, Dolores. You've only got one left. Fifty bucks? So now we've got confirmation that Eddie is broke, hounded by debt collectors, and owes money to this woman across the street. He asks for a camera to finish the job. She says she hasn't had the film developed since their trip to Catalina. Now watch her face and Eddie's reaction. It sure was a long time ago. Yeah, 
That was a long time ago. We'll have to do that again sometime. Yeah, sure, Eddie. From this, we can surmise there's a history. She's sad, he's flippant. Something happened. We don't know what, but Eddie seems like he's in denial about it. It's probably safe to say they were an item at one point. Finally, we get Angelo and the infamous egg smashing scene. Get this straight, Lean Ball. I don't work for Jones. So this action dialogue combo tells us two things. One, Eddie may look like a cream donut, but he can be dangerous. And two, his hatred of tunes is pathological. And that's when we get this payoff. Toon killed his brother. What? Huh? Dropped the piano on his head. So now we've got some answers. Remember the sign, Valiant and Valiant? Well, now we know what happened to the other Valiant, but we're still left with questions. What sort of detective is this guy? Why would a Toon kill his brother? What exactly is his connection to Toons? At the Ink and Paint Club, we get more clues. The first is a brilliant sight gag. Eddie orders a scotch on the rocks. And I mean ice! And of course, he gets a rock. But this tells us something important. This has obviously happened before, which means he has a history of dealing with tunes. The second clue comes from Betty Boop. She tells Valiant, long time no see. And for the first time, Eddie seems legitimately happy to see a tune. I love this smile he flashes when she says she's still got it. But I still got it, Eddie. Boop, boop, be doo boop. Yeah, you still got it. The acting, the dialogue, it's telling us that this is a nostalgic moment for Eddie. And it's very important on two levels. One, it tells us he definitely had a past with tunes, enough to know their quirks and seemingly connect with them on a personal level. And two, it's the first truly empathetic moment Eddie has had up until this point. Otherwise, he's been a pretty dickish guy, but his interaction with Betty shows it wasn't always that way. There's something inside of him that still has a soft spot for tunes. So let's recap what the movie's told us so far. Eddie Valiant is a broke, drunken, private detective that hates tunes because they killed his brother. Despite that, he once respected them. He has a history, maybe, with the woman running the bar, and the trip to Catalina seems like a sore subject. So far, we've got an idea or two about what this guy is about. And quite frankly, it ain't pretty. There really isn't anything likable about this guy. But that's about to change, because all of these little details will have a brand new context after this next film trick. Now watch what Zemeckis is going to do here, because it's kind of amazing. You are going to get a geyser of information, enough to fill a book, and it's all going to happen in under two minutes without a single line of dialogue. Hell, for part of it, without even the actor. This is Maison Scene Exposition. We're gonna learn everything about this guy by just looking at his stuff and how he interacts with it. So what can this set tell us? Well, let's start at the door, Valiant and Valiant. Yeah, even though his brother's dead, he still keeps the name up. Next, Eddie dumps clothes on his bed. The bed is out and unmade. This tells us he's not expecting business anytime soon. He grabs the recent photos and sits down with a full bottle of booze. Remember that. Almost instantly, he throws the Jessica Rabbit pictures to the side. Now we see Eddie and Dolores. This is Catalina. So we've confirmed they were indeed an item. Eddie seems happy. Then he pauses. He stumbles upon pictures of somebody. It seems like they were goofing off. In one of them, Eddie's eating a carrot like Bugs Bunny. Again, more proof that he liked tunes. But who is this other guy? Eddie's face tells us it's someone important, important enough for a grown man to cry over. Then, to confirm our suspicions, Eddie stares at the empty desk across from him. It's his brother's. The desk is dusty, untouched. There's a Betty Boop doll there. Remember how Eddie seemed nostalgic at the sight of her? As the camera slowly pans across the mise-en-scene, we see the rest of the story. 
Valiant and Valiant were Toon Detectives. This seems obvious now because the film has become so much a part of pop culture. But remember, we actually don't know this as audience members. This is the first time it's firmly established that Eddie and his brother worked specifically for tunes. And judging by the articles, they were great at it. They saved Huey, Dewey, and Louie. They <laughs> cleared Goofy of spy charges? Okay, I have to know. Was Goofy a communist or a Nazi? You think Donald converted him with a copy of Mein Kampf? I mean, what is the story behind that? Who even outed them? Mickey? I, you know what? Never mind. This is a rabbit hole not even Alice should go down. Where was I? Oh, yeah. We then find out they used to be cops. Now we know why Eddie could hold his own against Angelo. Then we see them as kids in the circus with their dad. And finally, we finish it off with their grand opening with Dolores. This brings us back to Eddie asleep with an empty bottle of booze now sitting right next to him. And guess what? It's morning now. That's right. This was a scene transition. You just got exposition and a transition all rolled up in one. That's a twofer. I can't stress how essential this scene was to the film's success. In 120 seconds, you got this entire guy's past, present, and future. You know where he came from, you know what he's become, and you've got a good idea of where he'll end up by the end of this, because this is a redemption story. Up until now, Eddie was a loser character with few redeeming qualities. But this brief, wordless, maison-scene transition changed all that. Hell, it changed the entire scope of the movie, because now we can go into the second act fully invested in this deeply broken character. This is the brilliance of what Robert Zemeckis did. And the scary thing is, this isn't even the first time he's done it. If you remember Back to the Future, he literally opened that film with the same trick. The opening credits there are feeding you information. What's more, both Back to the Future and Roger Rabbit didn't have these sequences in their original drafts. They were both cleverly designed rewrites meant to economically introduce the story's theme and characters. In Back to the Future's case, this is because the protagonist was recast during production. In Roger Rabbit's case, I feel either the screenwriters, directors, or both realized they needed to give the audience an anchor, something to tell us quickly why we should care about this guy. And that's the key with this sort of exposition. It rockets us forward and never really stops. And yet it's also spread out so thin and evenly, you'd swear it was perfectly buttered toast. Sometimes less is more, especially with exposition. Watch the first act of Roger Rabbit and you'll realize the movie doesn't have to pause for lengthy monologues. In fact, the only true monologues come at the end, and they are earned. Eddie's monologue about his brother's death at the end of Act 2 is a direct payoff to the Maison scene at the end of Act 1. It answers the last questions we had about Eddie's past and drives us forward into the next act. Sure, it violates the rules of show, don't tell, but Zemeckis already showed us plenty. At this point, he's earned the right to let his characters speechify. If there's a pattern to all of this, think of it as breadcrumb trailing. The film parses out every little detail in small, bite-sized chunks. And just as we're wondering, hey, that's interesting, why is that? It feeds us another crumb. And we follow crumb after crumb because they're so alluring because the filmmakers laid out their crumbs in such a perfect way that we never get overwhelmed, lost, or bored. As I showed earlier, every small question we have about our protagonist gets answered one scene later, and that answer stirs up another question, which leads us to another crumb, and so on and so on. This makes for pitch-perfect pacing. Each crumb satisfies us just enough, but always leaves us hungry for more. That, my friends, is intrigue, and it keeps us invested until we get to the big slices. The Maison scene, the flashback story, the R.K. Maroon confession, and Doom's freeway monologue. Watching the film again, I'm shocked at how tight and compact it is. Would you believe this film is only an hour and 45 minutes long? 
That's because every single scene is telling us something. Even the bits that look like they're there just to show off this gorgeous universe serve important plot functions. So much credit has to go to Robert Zemeckis and the screenwriters. When you think about it, Roger Rabbit should be a mess. It's overstuffed with fan service, references, characters from half a dozen different animation studios, metaphors for gentrification, urban renewal, and racism, laid thick with intrigue, real estate plots, and murder that all culminates in an animated live-action fusion of L.A. noir and screwball comedy. And yet somehow, Zemeckis and his team streamlined that into a perfectly paced blockbuster with mass audience appeal. How did they do it? Special effects? Sure, Zemeckis is a technical genius, but those are only the tools. In the end, they did it by making us care about this doughy, booze-swilling schlub and a cartoon rabbit. For me, it's proof that you don't always have to be the snootiest one at the party. Your movie can have this, and yet still have the care, craft, and dedication of this. Rosebud. Character matters, and it's the way those characters are presented that matters most. But perhaps I'm partial. You've been hanging around rabbits too long. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you don't. Either way, drop a line. And if you like what you see, feel free to subscribe. And if you don't like what you see, be civil. Otherwise, you keep talking like that and I'm gonna have to wash your mouth out. <laughs>